Welcome to the latest in round of Eureka Hedge Fund Manager interviews. Today I'm joined by Stefan Watchinger, who is a product specialist at Credit Suez Insurance Link Securities Division. Thank you for joining us, Stefan. Thanks for being here. So very briefly before, before we start off, what exactly are insurance link securities uh, and what is the opportunity for investors when looking at this asset class? With insurance link securities, uh, we try to access the reinsurance market for financial investors. And the beauty about it is that uh, we do reinsure natural catastrophes, mm. which do not have a direct link to the volatility of financial markets and therefore uh, provide a low correlation to many or basically to all the other uh, asset classes. Fair enough. So historically, based on uh, the Eureka Hedge Insurance Link Securities Hedge Fund Index that we have been tracking, we have looked at returns of around 4% annualized, very low stand annualized standard deviation, exceptional sharp ratios, Sortino ratios, uncorrelated, not just to the wider market, but to the hedge fund industry as a whole as well. But as of late, uh, I would say over the last three years since 2017, the industry appears to be wobbling a bit and the returns uh, have not been as spectacular as they used to be. So to share some numbers with you, uh, on a three-year annualized basis, the ILS hedge fund index has returned around negative 2.63%. Uh, in 2017, ILS funds were down around 5.60%. Uh, 2018, they were down around 4%. And as of September 2019, year to date, we are looking at a marginally uh, positive return of 0.85%. So what's been going on over here? I think here you can clearly see the characteristic of, of the asset class ILS. Hmm. You, do ex you do need to expect uh, a longer period with uh, stable returns where you just earn your premium. Hmm. But you also need to be aware of the tail risks included in that, in that asset class. And this has clearly been shown in 2017 especially, but also in 2018. Oh. Uh, 2019 is not yet finished, so we will see uh, how this works out. But you clearly have seen over the last two, two and a half years, also the risks which are included in the, in the asset class, which were not that visible on the, on the return side so far, uh, because we didn't have seen uh, in the recent past such large events as we've seen in the last two years. All right. So touching upon something that we were discussing uh, previously as well, there was this expectation that after 2017, when the industry had seen those kind of losses, perhaps premiums would start going up and then returns would be much better for investors who were coming in towards the end of uh, 2017, uh, a sort of uh, a buying the dip kind of situation in the market. However, it seems like that has not materialized. What's happening on the premium side of things? That is a very interesting question. Um, after 2017, after the record losses we've seen in the reinsurance market, uh, there was an expectation that the premiums will increase significantly. But what also happened is that billions of dollars came to the market uh, and therefore basically dumped that pressure on the premium levels. Mm. We've seen uh, premium increases, but by far not that significant as initially expected. Mm. Uh, in 2018, we've seen additional uh, events uh, causing negative uh, returns, as you've said earlier on. Uh, and with that, for the renewal period 2019, we've seen an additional step forward, uh, further improved uh, premium levels uh, in the market, mm -hmm. which of course helps the attractivity of the asset class. Mm -hmm. and what we've also seen now is that not much new capital came to the market, uh, which also helped the existing investors having a better position in renegotiating the, the transactions uh, for 2019. Mm. Um, now, what we've seen in 2019 now from an event perspective and performance perspective is that uh, some events from 2018, uh, most notably Typhoon Chepi, still cost uh, additional losses uh, mm. the year after mm. and now we've lately seen some new events uh, in the market say Typhoon Faxai or Typhoon Hagibis in, in Japan uh, and with those additional events uh, we got the indications from early talks with counterparties that there is also a likelihood that we see further increases in premium levels also in 2020 mm. uh, which in the end uh, further increases the attractiveness. But uh, those increased premium levels have not been uh, translated directly in positive returns for investors. Therefore, oh. investors do not see yet this, this uh, higher attractiveness of the asset class. So far, 
so far because uh, we, we've seen additional losses coming into the performance and uh, diluting the performance and bringing it even to, to negative, uh, negative uh, uh, rates again. All right. So it would seem like perhaps the industry or the ILS sector is a bit overcapitalized and the capital flows into this part of the industry have been suppressing premiums. Is, should that be a cause of concern for investors who are coming in? And just to add to that, you, you mentioned, you touched upon this as well, how losses in the previous year were kind of carrying forward to the, to the years down the line as well. So in terms of risk management for investors, one issue that often comes up is the issue of side pockets and how that affects an investor's return. Could you touch on that a bit for us as well? Uh, we believe side pocket is a, is a good instrument in order to separate possible future losses from new investors, but also when investors are going out that they do not get basically the wrong price at the time they go out. So we separate the potentially uh, effective positions in, in both ways. It can go either their losses are higher than expected or lower than expected, and therefore they could get the wrong price, let's say. And therefore we believe side pockets is a, is a good instrument to uh, to take care of this uncertainty uh, for the for the for the sake of the investors, uh, but it also has a negative element to that. Uh, with the part which is locked, which is maybe put into the side pocket, this is not immediately available to invest into new transactions. And th this can lead to a, a certain drag in in the investment degree of an ILS portfolio. Um, and therefore, it's very, very important how you uh, also take care of the existing investments, which may be in a side pocket or not, and be in contact with the counterparty in order to release the capital as soon as possible, in order to be able to invest it into new, into new investment. This is, in the, let's say, after the initial investment, uh, uh, another important part of uh, taking care of the investments mm. during the lifetime and even after the lifetime. Fair enough. So the next uh, thing I believe that's on the mind of a lot of uh, investors here at the Eureka Edge Alt Investor Conference as well, is that um, the issue of climate change. And for a lot of ILS hedge fund managers as well, we know a, a large part, part of their portfolio is concentrated to North American uh, catastrophe events um, and to a lesser extent to other parts of the world. So there's this issue. Are climate risks not being uh, effectively or to their full extent being captured in the existing models or is there perhaps some other reason that's been uh, leading to these kind of um, increased catastrophe event activities and losses for fund managers as well. So is climate risk um, effectively being modeled at the moment? Um, this is a question we hear quite a lot these mm. days mm. and you always hear these questions around times when there are a lot of events yeah. and which was the case in the last two years yeah. but interesting you mentioned north america yeah. and the, the the hurricane season exactly. um, when we look at the very long-term history of frequency of such hurricanes oh. uh, scientific data do not show a higher frequency in those in those events oh. uh, of course climate change is a is an element we are looking at and the whole ILS but also the reinsurance industry is relying on, on risk models mm. uh, trying to capture uh, the frequency of such events. Uh, those models are also improved continuously so from year to year we get new versions of, uh, of those models mm. and behind those models there are many many scientists working uh, continuously to improve that. So mm. Therefore, we always have the latest view of science on on the frequency of such events mm. and uh, and how it how it affects the reinsurance market as a as a whole. And therefore, we believe we do have a pretty good picture. Although mm. it's still a model, we know that models are are never perfect. Mm. Uh, uh, but we believe with uh, especially uh, hurricanes in the North Atlantic, there is so much capital involved in that risk oh. that, uh, that the scientists uh, and the models are capturing quite a, quite a good, good oh. view, of that, view of that risk. But of course, oh. if you see two years in a row with, uh, with hurricanes uh, causing billions of dollars of injured losses, then you start questioning, uh, questioning that. 
We believe uh, another trend is much, much more important than the climate trend, because climate trend is typically a couple of percentage points uh, over, over decades, uh, but population uh, growth, population growth, yeah. uh, <laughs> people, there are always more people living, mm. especially living in exposed uh, regions. Mm. When you look at the population in the US, you mm. see a much higher growth rate uh, in coastal areas mm. that you see inland. Mm. So more and more people want to live in those exposed um, uh, exposed areas. Mm. And this is something you need to you need to capture. And uh, when you just look at the city of Orlando, for example, mm. it has grown significantly, mm. and this is just a very exposed city in mm. Florida. Mm. And uh, those exposures you need to take care of. And this is something you can do by um, negotiating with counterparties, mm. depending on their exposure, how much should they take on their uh, retention level, mm. and when do we start to participate on their losses. Mm. Fair enough. And there could be an opportunity over here as well if all these issues actually start translating into premiums also moving in tandem with the, the climate risks or as you rightly mentioned population growth and the density in these kind of areas which were which are exposed to these kind of catastrophes in the end um, people and companies want to be injured against those risks yeah. because they know they're there hmm. and therefore they also need reinsurance coverage so over the very long term hmm. there is a need that there is a proper insurance and reinsurance market available, mm. and therefore, uh, in the end, premiums need to be uh, accurate for that, to mm. also be able to make money in that industry. Thank you, Stefan. And just on some parting thoughts before we, we let you go, we understand you have a busy schedule with us today as well. What is the current opportunity for, for investors right now in the, in the ILS space? And if you could briefly touch on the issue of capacity as well, how much capital can actually be absorbed into this as uh, we've seen today and for, the, for yesterday as well, a lot of large institutional investors in Europe have been looking at the ILS space given the uncorrelated returns, given how fixed income assets have been yielding negative returns in this part of the world and how there's concerns about equity markets being too frothy right now as well. So when looking at this asset class, what's the opportunity and how much capacity and scale does it have? Um, I think you mentioned one of the most important elements of ILS. Mm. It's very low correlated to all the other asset classes. Yeah. And this is still the beauty. It always has been the beauty. Yeah. But we also need to be aware of the risks which are included, which we basically have seen in 2017 yes. and 18 in yeah. that market. Yeah. Um, I think the overall ILS market uh, is around 90 to 100 billion. Okay. Um, at the moment, uh, when we look at the overall industry, we don't see too much uh, capital inflow at the moment. Uh, I think this is as a result of the negative returns for the uh, past two years. Uh, uh, so therefore, at the moment, uh, I believe it's, it's interesting for the existing investors to be invested because the negotiation power of the available capital at the moment uh, uh, has improved. Uh, um, so I don't want to put an absolute number of how much capital can be, can be absorbed, but uh, I think it's as we, as we operate in the reinsurance market, which is typically a bit slower moving than, let's say, an equity market where yeah. you have daily pricing, daily in and Correct. out. Yeah. Uh, you need to be aware that if you bring quite a lot of capital, this can take some time until it's properly invested. Oh. So you need the renewal cycles, which typically are once in a year, and then uh, you need over time to, to deploy the capital very properly and not to be forced to take any risk available on the oh. market, but to be selective uh, to those risks which you really need and you really want to have in your portfolio. Thank you very much, Stephen. It's a pleasure speaking with you. Yes. For our viewers watching um, uh, at home or at their offices, if you have any questions, you can send, send those to us at advisor at eurekahedge.com, which should be flashing at the bottom of your screen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Stefan.